First of all, let me say welcome to the Minneapolis Fed. I see this workshop as being one more step on an important intellectual journey for the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And that journey has been going on for many years, long before I became president of the bank in 2009. As most of you know, um, Ron Feldman and my predecessor Gary Stern literally wrote the book on Too Big to Fail nearly 10 years ago. Like many others, and for the good of the country, I hope that our Too Big to Fail journey is complete before another decade passes. And the work that all of you are doing is critical to making that hope a reality. Um, I should say, although I, I don't think I have it <laughs> written down here, that I'm going to be uh, speaking on behalf of myself and uh, the opinions I express today are not necessarily those of anyone else in the Federal Reserve System. Uh, another point, we're going to have questions and answers after I'm done speaking. Um, unlike the rest of the conference, this portion of the, of the proceedings is open to the media. And, uh, and so you, you should keep that in mind when you, you formulate your questions. <coughs> I, I will be keeping it in mind when I formulate my answers. <coughs> so my theme tonight is that metrics should play a key role in the regulation and management of the too big to fail problem. I'll be using TBTF, which uh, the, an acronym will be familiar to everyone in this room. I will proceed in three steps. I'll first define what I see as the TBTF problem. As you will hear, I, hear I, th I, I see the TBTF problem as being about a particular kind of misallocation of resources. More specifically, excessively risky investments that are incented by the prospect of governmental absorption of losses that would otherwise be endured by the creditors of financial institutions. So that's a mouthful, but the key word in there is prospect. So it's the expectation of government transfers that create the problematic, dis problematic distortion, not the realization of those transfers. So I'll next turn to why I see metrics as being essential to the management of the too big to fail problem. Without metrics, policymakers and the public that they serve can have no true insight into the effectiveness of the current management of the problem. Now, as this group well knows, and uh, we've been spending our time talking about, any given measure of the size of the too big to fail problem is imperfect. But I will argue that the, the imperfection of any single measure implies that policymakers should track progress using many measures, not ignore all of them. Finally, I'll talk about two aspects of the use of metrics in the management of the too big to fail problem. Why it's important to use measures besides size, and why it may be important to assess the robustness of too big to fail measures to certain kinds of shocks. <clears throat> Let me start then uh, by defining what I mean by the too big to fail problem. As I, I, I mentioned already, I'm going to use this term to refer to a type of inefficiency in the allocation of societal resources. In particular, I'm referring to the excessively risky investments that are incented when creditors of a financial institution believe that there is some likelihood that at least some of their losses will be absorbed by the government. Now, I know that the nature of this inefficiency is familiar to everybody in this room, but let me talk through it more carefully. Imagine first that creditors did not anticipate any form of governmental loss absorption. Then, if a financial uh, institution decided to increase the risk level of its investment portfolio, its debt holders would face a greater risk of loss. By way of compensation for that greater risk, those debt holders would demand a higher yield on, the, uh, on, uh, on, their, on their debt holdings. As a result, in the absence of government guarantees, financial institutions would find it more costly to obtain debt financing for highly risky investments relative to less risky ones. This effect on the margin would curb a firm's appetite for risk. But now suppose instead that a financial institution's creditors believe that they are partially insulated from losses. <clears throat> then those creditors do not demand a sufficiently high yield when they lend to riskier institutions. Financial institutions end up taking on too much risk because they're no longer deterred from doing so by the high cost of debt finance. 
Now, there are two particular aspects of this definition that I think are worth noting. First, it's an ex ante definition. I'm not referring to the ex post manifestation of governmental loss absorption in the form of transfers or bailouts. In my formulation of the too big to fail problem, the damage to society through the re misallocation of resources has already occurred by the time that the government actually makes its transfers or undertakes any bailouts. Now, to be clear, like many other observers, I do find it troubling when governments use funds from relatively poor taxpayers to protect relatively rich bo bank bondholders from losses. Now, I'm not using the term too big to fail problem to refer to concerns about this kind of redistribution. Second, the definition emphasizes the role of creditor beliefs about prospective governmental transfers. The beliefs of other parties are much less relevant. For example, to the management or board of directors of a given financial institution, the too big to fail problem simply means that their costs of debt finance are relatively unaffected by the amount of risk in their firm's investment portfolio. <coughs> you know, what the source of that lack of variation uh, need, it, it, it does not really concern them. So that's the, the, the first part I wanted to lay out, is exactly what I mean by the too big to fail problem. And as I've defined it, the too big to fail problem involves a misallocation of resources. So let me move on to my next point, which is the need to use metrics in the management of the problem. Now, as we all know, at the direction of legislators, bank regulators and bank supervisors have taken a variety of steps to reduce or end the misallocation associated with the too big to fail problem. As a result, the public knows that large financial institutions have more and better capital than they did five years ago. And the public also knows that these institutions have constructed lengthy, lengthy plans, so-called living wills, that describe their strategies for rapid and orderly resolution in the event of material financial distress or failure. What the public does not know is whether the adoption of these steps has been associated with a material change in the size of the too big to fail problem. And my theme tonight is that policymakers can only identify and document progress in the reduction of the too big to fail problem by using measures of the magnitude of the problem. Now the good news is I think that it is, it is clear what we want to measure. The heart of the too big to fail problem is that some financial institutions are able to borrow too cheaply in light of the risks they face in their uh, investment portfolios. What we need to measure then is the size of that subsidy to debt finance. Now, of course, as this group well knows, the conceptual formulation of the problem only gets us so far. Actually constructing reliable measures of the subsidy is, is, has a number of challenges. And that's why we're having this workshop and why it's important. And admittedly, at this point in time, and probably for some time to come, every measure of the magnitude of the problem has to be seen as imperfect. And some might be tempted to conclude from these imperfections that it would be inappropriate to track progress with respect to too big to fail using any of the measures. I cannot emphasize how wrong I believe this conclusion to be. Rather than using no measures, policymakers should be tracking all measures that are viewed as being at least somewhat informative about the size of the subsidy. Now here I find an analogy for the monetary policy part of my job to be helpful. So I, I serve on the Federal Open Market Committee and the FOMC is charged by Congress with two objectives, promoting price stability and maximum employment. These, there are relatively uncontroversial metrics that we can use to track progress on the former objective on price, in terms of price stability. But it is not as obvious how we should track progress with respect to the latter objective, the, the uh, maximum employment uh, mandate. Every possible metric, be it the unemployment rate or the employment population ratio, has its own flaws. But the response of the FOMC is hardly to abandon metrics altogether. <coughs> 
Instead, monetary policymakers track labor market performance using a large number of measures. For example, in a speech earlier this month, my, the president of the St. Louis Federal Reserve, uh, James Bullard, depicted recent labor market performance and recent labor market improvement using a variety of dimensions, uh, uh, along a variety of dimensions, using an elegant spider chart. I can well see similar charts as being useful in providing the public with assessments of the size of the too big to fail problem for a given financial institution. So I, I've, I've talked about um, how, to, how I, I'm defining the too big to fail problem and then talked about the, the need to use metrics to track uh, uh, the management of that problem. Let me close by offering two comments about too big to fail metrics. And the first comment, again, I, I think is more aimed at people outside of this room than the people inside of the room. Some observers are drawn to using the size of a financial institution as a sufficient statistic for the magnitude of the too big to fail problem associated with that institution. After all, it's called the too big to fail problem. And you, actually, if you saw our banners for the conference, we sort of fed into this with the huge too big um, and then the little too fail uh, part here. This kind of approach of focusing on size would suggest that society can best manage the too big to fail problem by capping the size of financial institutions, make sure they don't get too large. Now, I, I certainly agree uh, with these observers that the size of a financial institution is likely to be a useful source of information about the magnitude of that institution's too big to fail problem. But at the same time, though, policymakers should guard against relying too much on this single metric. We should always keep in mind that the term too big to fail is highly misleading. The too big to fail problem is about creditor perceptions of loss protection. Creditors might well see the smaller of two institutions as being more likely to receive that protection. If the smaller institution is engaged in some kind of activity that is seen by government agencies as being especially vital. This goes back to the conversation that we had earlier today about what exactly are institutions, what kind of activities are they engaged in, and which ones um, are going to be seen as being particularly vital by, by the government. So if we go back to 2008, government funds were used to facilitate the purchase of Bear Stearns by J.P. Morgan Chase. No such government funds were made available to facilitate the resolution of Lehman. And Lehman was certainly larger uh, than Bear Stearns. The second comment is about the need to assess the robustness of too big to fail measures to particular kinds of shocks. I define the too big to fail problem in terms of the subsidy to debt finance created by the possibility of governmental loss absorption. Now certainly, policymakers can only claim success with respect to the too big to fail problem if the current measures of that subsidy are low. But they may want to accomplish more than that. The too big to fail subsidy to a financial institution is guaranteed, is generated by its creditors' perceptions of government loss absorption. Now, there, the, the subsidy will be worth little if creditors believe that the institution's assets have little risk. So that it's highly unlikely that the institution will ever incur losses for the government to absorb. It may be prudent for supervisors and regulators to also check that the subsidy remains small if creditors begin to perceive that the institution's asset risk uh, is actually materially large. I see these kinds of robustness checks as being challenging to implement with existing too big to fail measures. I'm going to wrap up by returning to my main theme, which is the need to use metrics in the management of the too big to fail problem. However imperfect those metrics might be. Basically, the issue comes down to accountability. And again, I find a monetary policy analogy to be helpful. As monetary policymakers, my colleagues on the FOMC and I are accountable for keeping the economy at maximum employment. We are well aware that we need to use metrics to demonstrate that we're making progress with respect to that responsibility. No one metric is perfect, 
And so we refer to a wide variety of somewhat informative measures. And the Federal Reserve actually spends a great deal of time trying to develop other, again, imperfect measures to supplement those that we already have. I see the too big to fail problem as highly similar. Supervisors and regulators have been made accountable by Congress for ending the too big to fail problem. They need to be able to demonstrate clear progress to the public, uh, for uh, uh, clear progress to the public with respect to that responsibility. They can only do so by using the metrics in this workshop and metrics that we developed uh, in metrics in, in workshops still to come. Thanks to all of you for listening, and, and thanks for coming to Minneapolis. And I'm, I look forward to taking your questions.